It is a great pleasure to be here with you again today. This is not going to be an ordinary sermon, but a personal testimony about a promise I made to the Lord and how he helped me keep it. It is also the story of a book that I have written, especially a book called Christ and Antichrist in Prophecy and History. After I would made that promise, amazing ev events took place. Consequences for me and the rest of the family. Another point I want to emphasize, though, is that it is important to keep our promises to God. It is dangerous to break them. Remember the scripture which says that God takes no pleasure in fools. In 1986, we were still in South Africa, and my wife, Rhea, in Pretoria, had serious lung surgery. Both of us doubted whether she would survive. And so I made a promise to God that if she did, I would write a book about prophecy for him. After I'd retired from teaching at a college near Pretoria in 1990, I began to do so. Uh, but research facilities in that country were inadequate. There was a slump in the economy, and suddenly one had to pay $50 per year for each branch of a library that one visited. That obviously was not conducive to writing the book. I needed plenty of research facilities. But through a wonderful series of events, the Lord made it possible for our elder son to marry an American citizen. And that opened the way for us to come here. On March 29th, 1994, Rhea and I stepped off a plane at San Francisco International Airport. We had flown from South Africa by Aeroflot, a Russian airline, over Malta in the Mediterranean, Moscow, northern Greenland, and Alaska. Now, you may think that is a very peculiar route to follow. But remember the shape of the Earth. So we arrived in San Francisco. But I did not know that on that very day, in New York City, on the other side of the continent, Catholics and Evangelicals had signed a joint declaration to cooperate. The Antichrist was beginning to gain power in modern America. What I also didn't know was that the influence of Catholicism and apostate Protestants was sneaking into the Seventh-day Adventist Church through some of our learned people who studied at non-Adventist universities. People who denied, for instance, that the 666 in Revelation 13 referred to Vicarius Filii Dei, 
the vicar of the Son of God, the representative of the Son of God, which is a papal title. So they were denying it, and some of them are still denying it. But I stand for the three angels' messages, what Uriah Smith wrote, what I learned when I did my theology. I graduated from theology in 1950, which is a little while ago. So now we were in California. But I didn't have much chance to write that book there because we had to adjust. We had to find a way of making a living. Now, both Rhea and I had been college teachers back in South Africa. But uh, Americans are skeptical of foreign qualifications. And we couldn't find any work in Northern California. We had uh, stayed at Anderson with our son before we had gone. Oh, I skipped something. We were there, and then we went into uh, an apartment in Reading. This was 150 miles northwest of Sacramento. But there was no work, even though we'd been teachers. And as I say, Americans are skeptical of foreign qualifications. Ria also tried her work at being a coal porter because she had been a very good coal porter in South Africa. But things were different here. Here you couldn't just go up to a door and knock on it and expect people to invite you in. It's not like that. So we did a drastic thing. In 1995, halfway through the year, we flew to South Korea to go and teach English and Bible at the Seventh-day Adventist Language Institute. We spent a year in the city of Incheon on the west coast of South Korea. It is a city of three and a half million people. It has no street names. It is very different there. And almost nobody spoke English except at the Language Institute uh, where we taught. While we were there, I worked on the book. This book, Christ and Antichrist and Prophecy in History, was written in South Africa in South Korea and finished in the United States, actually down here in the valley. A very international book, I think. While at Incheon to do research, on a Sunday I would go by train to Seoul, the capital of South Korea, and visit the British Embassy as well as the American Embassy and find material in their libraries. I'd go back home. I would do my work during the week. We work very hard. Koreans work very hard, and if you work for Koreans, you will know what work is. But at night and over the weekends, I kept on working at that book. And so we came back to the United States, back to California, and we had saved some money from that stipend, which was not very large, that we had got in Korea. But still, there was no work in Northern California. So we took our used Toyota and our used 
uh, Ford um, truck with a cab of a camper, which we had bought before we went to Korea. Now you'd say, where did we get the money? Well, we sold a house in South Africa. That's where we got it. But now we had to go somewhere else. We had seen a video about a place called McAllen, where housing and food is cheaper. And I knew it was near the Mexican border. You see, we had no medical. And so, I think it was 2,400 miles, we came down and arrived here in July, 1996. We wanted to see whether we could tolerate the heat. And the heat here in summer is something. We had been in touch with Dr. Andrew Leone, who is a South African. He was the principal of the Valley Grand Academy near Westlaco. And he thought they could make use of us teaching English as a second language. Well, we came down, but just then, Andrew Leone handed over the work to somebody else. And there was no work for us at the Valley Grand Academy. But the Lord opened the way, so I got work part-time teaching at the university and at STCC. But because of my foreign qualifications, in spite of my MA and other things, well, it was part-time. And a real situation was even a little worse. She had a BA from South Africa plus some other qualifications. So she had to start studying, uh, do TASP and other things so that they would recognize her qualifications. And she also started working on her master's degree. Now, all of that put a strain on our finances. We received pensions from South Africa, but because of the exchange rate, they sort of shrank from $1,000 a month to about $420 a month. And that was not very nice. So we had to supplement that with part-time work and so on. For a while, I think it was for eight months, we were actually on food stamps. But it was a special kind of food stamps, only $46 per person per month. But in the year 2001, certain things happened. Suddenly, I was knocked off the labor market because I got congestive heart failure. And Frank here will remember coming along and finding me lying there on my bathroom floor and I had to be rushed off to hospital. And I had no medical, nothing like that. And not very long after that, Rhea lost her third part-time job. And there we were. Well, uh, my book appeared. Christ and Antichrist prophecy in history, the year 2001. And sometimes it was just from some book sales. We sold some books while I was still in the hospital in the intensive care unit. And uh, that sometimes supplied the next meal, so to speak. And they were kind people who made donations and helped out. So when you talk about, you know, being just about down and out, we know about it. We've been there. But now, what was I going to do? I couldn't go back to work anymore. 
So Ria said, write. And from then on, I wrote. And in addition to this book, I wrote four other books on prophecy. So it proved a great blessing, actually, although at the time we didn't think of it that way. Now, in the year 2000, we became American citizens. We managed somehow. Our pensions improved because of the exchange rate. So from 2001 to 2018, I was writing. And a friend suggested to Ria that she take a study loan. We'd actually been paying for her to take some classes on an MA. It was expensive. But then she turned 65, and they waived the tuition, although she still had to pay for the expensive books. And you know that that study loan enabled us to live. You even had to buy another car, because the old Toyota, second-hand Toyota, the used Toyota, uh, said goodbye, and we had to get another car. So we struggled along. In the year uh, 2010, I had another setback. A few days after my 80th birthday, I suddenly had thrombosis. And the devil was again trying to kill me. I was writing a book called The Truth About 666 and the Story of the Great Apostasy. But I survived. And I suffered no brain damage. And my kidneys didn't uh, quit on me. These things apparently can happen when you have uh, bypass surgery and stuff like that. I had a quadruple bypass. But again, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't go back to other kind of work, so I continued. In the year uh, 2011, that book appeared, The Truth About 666. And in 2013, a second edition of this book, Christ and Antichrist in Prophecy and History. This is my favorite of my books. This is the original book that I really promised to write the Lord, to write for the Lord, and which I finished. But that was not the end of the story. Uh, by the way, you'll ask, where did I get the money for printing these books? Well, we started by using up what we had saved in South Korea. And when Ria was at the university, because she got a university job, let me tell you about that first. She was 68 when she got a master's degree at UTPA, as they used to call it. And you know what? She got A's in everything except for one subject, a B. Why? because she had talked to religion in class. And she was penalized for that. She says she's very proud of that B. It stands for Bible. She helped to finance some of my writing as well. And we had donors. One very kind donor, a non seventh day Adventist, who thinks highly of my writing he has paid for the printing of many of my books. Then there were also lecture tours. I got invitations. And Ria always went with me. And most of the time, other people paid for what I was playing. In the United States and 
even we went into Mexico at Montemorelos University for a series of uh, lectures. We went to Florida, where there was the magisterium of that Union Conference, and a series at the Kentucky-Tennessee camp meeting. In 2012, I was invited to come and address the Adventist Theological Society at Southern University in Tennessee. We were flown up twice to Canada for television recordings for Amazing Discoveries. I have already appeared there, and I am due to appear some more when the series Enmity has been continued. Then I got an invitation to go to Cuba in 2014, and I did not like it. I didn't want to go. It was a principle with me never to visit a communist country. I just did not want to go, but the person who invited me had a missionary enterprise there, Henry Stubbs, and so we went. And I presented four lectures. Uh, no, it was five. No, it was originally four here at La Vibora Seventh Adventist Church in Havana. And there we met somebody called Nestor Rivero, who interpreted for me from English into Spanish, a very smart person. I wondered at first whether those folks would follow some of this stuff. It was a little learned. But you know what? They lapped it up. Because Cubans are the best educated Latinos in all of Latin America. I think one out of every 11 of them uh, went to a university. They are poor but they're well educated. And by the way, the Cubans who got out of there, who are in the United States, are some of the most prosperous people you have around. And so we came back. And I realized that that uh, series can be expanded into five chapters and become another book. And I produced a more sure word of prophecy. Back in Cuba, Nestor Rivero translated it for me. And that book uh, became La Palabra Profetica Mas Segura. It was actually printed in Cuba and brought out with personal luggage by people who went there and came back. But then something else happened. Nestor Rivero also translated Christ and Antichrist. And it became Cristo y Antichristo en la profecía y la historia. And that book, which began as an idea in South Africa, as a promise to God, got some more remarkable things. You see, Nestor would translate sections and send them to me as email attachments. I can read Spanish fairly well. I don't speak it much. I won't try to write it. But I had to reformat it. And then I sent it as another series of uh, email attachments to Australia. And there was a man, a research scientist, Dr. Byron Viacorta. And he translated it and sent it back piecemeal. And I incorporated it in a book here. And uh, you see, what did he do? Uh, he uh, edited it, you see. He edited Nestor's work. You can't just publish things. You've got to be, be edited, have it checked. And here, uh, 
a little more editing took place. Perhaps some of you remember Esteban Hidalgo, who used to be the youth pastor at the Edinburgh English Church. He's now working on his doctorate at a Methodist university somewhere in the east of the country. He teaches at our university in Puerto Rico. And it was also checked by uh, Hector Ramal. I don't know whether you remember Hector Ramal. In 2003, he had invited us to go to Montemorelos, where I had lectured. And he read, really recommended this book that it should be translated into Spanish. Well, now it was translated, and he had an opportunity to check it a little bit. And so I have here first the English, Christ and Antichrist in Prophecy and History. And here I have Christo e Antichristo in la Profecia e la Historia. And uh, this book, which started as a promise to God back in South Africa, has continued its life. It has traveled along, sometimes a roundabout distance, just as we have. And I believe it still has a long way to go. I'm already 88 years of age, so this book will survive me. It will go on longer. Uh, recently, I started getting in touch with some people in Brazil see whether they could translate it into Portuguese. Did you know there are more people who can read Portuguese than any other language in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? There are one and a half million of them just in Brazil and another half million in different parts of Africa and in Portugal itself. So what will happen to this book eventually, where it will go, what it will do, I cannot tell you. But it was for us a remarkable journey. And you will ask me, what does this have to do with you? I'm sure there are some others here who could come up here and tell an equally remarkable story. And there are people who have promised the Lord to do things for him. If you've done so, keep your promises. God takes no pleasure in fools. Keep your promises. Because there's work for us to do in completing the task that he has given us all as servant to Adventists. And if you are faithful, he will bless you also abundantly. <laughs>